So thank you, Alfred, for the introduction. So lately, everyone's talking about COVID-19. Why not? And of course, we're also talking about COVID today. But we're not going to talk, luckily, about COVID directly, but about something that's very closely related and a bit more in our metier. We will talk about modeling and simulation of epidemics. I'm sorry. To find yeah. so and with that I want to present to you the epidemic model designer which is which is joint work in Matia Pasch and Konstantinas Panagiotou. Our agenda for today is at first we will talk about epidemic models, compartment models, and in particular we will talk about the SIR model, which you will then design with our epidemic model designer. After that, we will talk about the SEIR model, which we will also design. After that, we will talk about some other models and we will conclude with one application of our tool. So starting with the SIR model, I said it's a compartment model. That is, you take the population and you partition it into compartments that have some characteristic. Here, in this case, we have three compartments, the number, the, the susceptibles, so we have some disease and the susceptibles might contract that disease. If they contracted that disease, they are infectious. So there's the second compartment is the infectious. Those are those that are infected and might also infect others. And the third compartment is the recovered, that are those that already recovered from the disease. So they are no longer susceptible. They, ca they cannot contract the disease and they are, not, they are not infectious. So they cannot infect anymore. This gives our rise to a state diagram. So we have three states, the states S, I, and R, susceptible, infectious, and recovered. And we have some transmissions from these states to another. So we have the state S, and if you get infected, you move to state I, and when you recover, you move to state R. And these states, they have some number of people that are in each state. So we, each state has some, some value, is the number of people in state S. And what we want to know is how the numbers of people in each state changes over time. So let's say we do have some function S that gives us the number of people in state S. And S of T is then the number of susceptibles at time T. And we do want to know how do these functions S of T, I of T, and R of T behave. So how do they change over time when T is changed? And we have some parameters. We have the transmission rates. So beta is the rate of transmission from susceptible to infectious. That is the rate of contact and infection. And gamma is the transmission rate from I to R. So that's the rate of recovery. And we have some initial values for susceptibles, infected, and recovered. And with these parameters, we then can quantify how the functions S, I, and R change. So we cannot directly quantify the functions S, I, and R, but we can quantify how they change over time. And that is, we can quantify the derivative of we can quantify derivative with respect to time. So partial S divided by partial T, that's the derivative of the function F with respect to the time, with, with respect to T. And how does S change over time? So the change of S that depends on the rate of contact information, and that's also proportional to the number of susceptibles and proportional to the number of infections. So the more susceptible and the more infectious, the more the function S will change. So we have the term minus because the number of susceptible decreases over time. And then the term depends on the contact and infection rate and is proportional to the value of S and the value of I. That term that decreases the function S also increases the function I because everyone that moves from susceptible comes to infectious. So you move from S to I with rate beta times S times I. That was the first transmission from S to I. Then we have a second transmission from I to R, that's recovery. So when you recover, you recover at rate 
gamma and it's proportional to i. The, the more the infectious people are, the more recover at some point. So we have a negative sign because the infectious decreases with rate gamma and is proportional to i. And the same term we now also have at the change of r. So everything that moves from r then gets added to r. It moves removed from i then gets added to r. So now we define some uh, um, differential equation system that tells us how these functions behave. And if we can uh, say something about these, these functions, then we can also say something about the model. And that's what we actually want to know. So we have these differential equations and we want to solve them to analyze the behavior of the underlying model that we want to use to say something about the spread of some pandemic. And that is where our epidemic model designer comes into play, which I will show you right now. So at the left side here, we have the plane where we enter the states. So we have already the state S, then we enter the state I and the state R, and then we enter the transmissions, the transmission rate. So we have the transmission beta from S to I, and that depends on S and I. And we have the transmission from I to R, the gamma, that depends on I. So on the left side here, we have our model. In the bottom left, you can see the differential equations. And on the right side, on the bottom, we enter the initial conditions. And at the top, we will then see the plot. So let's say, I'm from Munich, uh, or we from Munich. We want to now model the COVID spread in Munich, in the city of Munich. So here we see the number of susceptibles are normalized to one. So we always assume that there is one susceptible. So if we are in a city of 1 million about, then if we want to say, let's say, we start with one infected person at the start, we need to set the number of infectious, so E0 at the start to one or 10 to the minus six. So if we have 1 million people and they are normalized to one, that then one person is equal to 10 to the minus six. So at the start, we assume we have one infected, we have zero recovered, and the rest are susceptible. Then we also need to set some transmission rates. Let's say, we start with 0.04 as the recovery rate, and we start with 0.12 as the infection rate. And let's say, furthermore, we want to model the spread over one year, so 365 days. Then we see here our three functions S, I, and R. So the red function that is, starts at one and increases is the number of susceptibles. The blue function that starts small, then goes up and goes down, that's the infectious. And the green function is the number of recovered. And already from that plot, you can infer two very important properties of the model. That is the number of people that get infected over the spread of the disease. So every, how many people actually got the disease? And you can read that at the end point of the recovered line. So everyone who's recovered at one point contracted, contracted the, the disease. So at here we say maybe 94% are recovered at the end. So 94% of the population contracted, contracted the disease at some point. And this number is maybe important because let's say 1% or 2% of all people that contract the disease die, that, all this, that directly gives you the de death toll of the disease at the end. And the second number that you can infer from this graph is the peak here of the blue line. That is the maximum number of infected people at one point. So 30% here of the population at one point are infected at the same time. And this is also an important number because Let's assume some proportion, let maybe 10% are hospitalized of all people that are infected. So 
if you have 30% of the population sick at a given time, maybe 3% of the population are then hospitalized at the same time, which tells you how many beds perhaps you need in, in the hospital or if your hospital, hospitals or if your health system will crash or not. So these are two very important characteristics of a model that you can read from these diagrams. So going back to the slides, we now continue on with the SEIR model that's very similar to the SIR model with a small change that we add a fourth component. So we have the susceptibles, the infectious and the recovered, and now we have additionally a component of exposed and that's meant to simulate the incubation period. So when you contract the disease, you no longer move directly to infectious, but at first you become exposed. So you're infected, but you are not yet infectious. You are in your incubation period. And after the incubation period, you then become infectious. So we see on the right side, the states S, E, I, R. And from S, if you get infected, we move to E, and then we move to I, and then we move to R. In the same way as before, we can now also derive the differential equations. Not a lot changes, but the rate of the rate of change of E now contains the beta times SI that was previously in the rate of I. And we have some additional parameter mu, that's the incubation period, that is all now subtracted from the rate of E. So in the second line here, we have the rate of E with respect to T, that's beta times SI minus mu times E. And then the derivative of I in the third line, it's mu times E minus gamma times E. So we have this, uh, this additional state and one more line in our differential equation system. Now we want to go back to our model designer and adjust our model to the new model that we just saw. So we add one state E and add a transmission rate mu and we change the transmission here to, oh no, what do I want to do? I want to change the T. Okay, so we, we change the trans transmission from S now goes to E. It's still dependent on T. On I, and we have a new transmission mu. So we need to uh, set a value for the incubation period, let's say 0 0.1. And the first thing we see is that the infection gets flat, the curve gets flattened because no, there are not as many people sick at the same time. So the, the incline is not as steep. So maybe let's look at two years now. And we see that it's the same amount of people get infected, but they're not, not everyone, not, that, not as many are, are infected at the same time. One further thing that we implemented here is adding interventions. So so-called maybe non-pharmaceutical interventions that is to change the transmission rates. So in the COVID outbreak in Munich, that was the lockdown. So let's say after 100 days of the, of the pandemic, there was a lockdown declared and thus the transmission rate changed. It went maybe to 0, 0.0. Now um, uh, we can't see anything anymore. So we have to switch to log logarithmic scale so that we can see those small numbers properly. And in the logarithmic scale, there are two, uh, or there's one important thing to see. That's a linear, a linear function in logarithmic scale. That means there's exponential function in, uh, in linear scale. So linear growth in, in logarithmic scale, that means exponential growth in, uh, in linear scale. So you see that the pandemic grows exponentially, exponentially and then the intervention happens and we re reduce the transmission rate and now the transmission rate is less than the recovery rate, so the disease will die out. So it decreases again exponentially. But maybe the lockdown is only in effect for another 100 days. So at time t equals t2 equals 200, there is another intervention. 
and we in, again increase the transmission rate. Bec now maybe we increase it to 0 0.8 because there is no longer a lockdown, but maybe we have social distancing and mandatory face masks. So we have a transmission rate of 0 0.08 instead of 0 0.01 as we had at the beginning. And again, we see the transmission rate is now bigger than the incubation, uh, the recovery rate, and we again have linear growth in the logarithmic, logarithmic scale or exponential growth in the linear scale. And if you go back, we again see that we have 10% of people infected at the same time. And if we maybe increase the period a bit, let's say we look at three years, then we can also see that now 80% maybe are infected at the end of the spread. And with that, you can uh, add more states as one would like. Going back, we uh, saw the SEIR model, and there are plenty of other models. I actually only want to highlight one to you. That's the, the green one here in the middle. The, the S, the state S, that should be familiar to, to you now. That's the state of the susceptibles. Then the E is exposed and R is recovered. Then the I1 and I2, those are two different states of infectious. So two different properties in infectious and the Q should be donated quarantined and the H is hospitalized. And why I want, why I wish, want to show you to you is because this model here, the S, Q, I, E, I1, I2, H on R, that's a model that was used in a research paper in this year where um, some researchers used this compartment model to uh, model the spread of the COVID-19 in Hubei province. So that's actually a model that was used in actual research paper. And with that, I want to show you the application that we had in mind when designing this tool is we want to uh, give a tool to researchers that want to study a compartment model, because typically a researcher might come up with some model and there is where the magic happens, okay? Because coming up with the model is where the, the knowledge of the field is important. So knowing what's important and what's not important, that's, so coming up with the model is the hard part. But then you want to know how your model behaves that you just came up with. And to learn that, you typically derive the differential equations from the model as we just saw, and then you simulate those differential equations, maybe using Python, Maple, Java, or any other programming language. And then you look at the, the plots and learn how your model behaves. But steps three and four, or all the steps other than one, it's not really biological or epidemic, it's a math. So, our tool provides steps three and four, and to, uh, to, to learn the behavior of the model now no longer requires math or programming skills. So uh, with that, um, I think I'm pretty much done. And maybe as a last, short picture, I will show you uh, and the S, Q, H, I1, I2, R model that I just showed you as the research from research page paper, I entered it to our tool and it maybe looks like this. And you can toggle all the lines that you want to see. So with that, I'm finished and thanks for listening.